Thank you today, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise be the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Almighty God. We praise you, Lord Jesus. 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 We thank you, Almighty God. Let's ask the Lord to bless this session today. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus. Seated. Praise the Lord. Well, this has certainly been a great camp. I have personally been tremendously benefited by being here with you. I am positive that I've received more benefit than I have been, but uh, that's just one of the fringe benefits of coming down here to be a part of the teaching staff. I've always enjoyed coming to Louisiana. Appreciate the ministry here and the great work that you're you're doing. Amen. We had a tremendous service last night. Great move of God. Great joy and blessing. Folks were healed and filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm sure many. There was one casualty, however, and that was my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know of anybody that got a pair that will trade me or not. I I can see my Bible with this, but I can't read it. <laughs> so somebody got a pair stronger. Let me try, Brother Fontenot. Are you very near sighted? 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 Oh, that's a lot better. Here, Brother Fontenot. <laughs> I don't know if I'm nearsighted or farsighted. I've never been to an eye doctor. Now, those are uh, drugstore drug classes. $8.88, but, but I was able to see. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, a lot of you have said that the message for the ordination service was a help to you and I am so glad I got it on the platform. I came there with the wrong message. That's the reason I had that rash on my chest. <laughs> so the Lord helped me to get the right one while Brother Coon was teaching. <laughs> I tried to be inconspicuous, but I wasn't ready. But uh, I'm so glad it is, was helpful to you. And in fact, it's in harmony. It was in harmony with what we're doing right here. It's in harmony with verse 24 of the 20th chapter of Acts. The Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24 in this farewell address, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear, unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Nothing will bring more joy and satisfaction to us than just simply knowing that we're in the will of God. If I know my heart, sometimes we don't, but uh, if I know my heart, I am willing to do anything as long as I know it's the will of God. Whether it be pastor a big church or a small church or preach to a little congregation or whatever, I, I, uh, I really feel, I really feel that in my heart that I desire and happy in the will of God, whatever that happens to be. I remember one time, this is not a boast, but just to make a point, one year when missionary evangelism <clears throat> with my own two eyes in one year's time I seen over 4,000 people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost 
And according to Brother Sism, there was another 6,000 received the Holy Ghost that year as the immediate direct results of those meetings through the lives and ministries of those that were in the meetings. And the Lord snatched me out of that situation and sent me to a little town in West Virginia to, to pastor and to begin to work there. Just literally snatched me out of that place. And I started with six people. And, uh, and uh, we had a vote. Seven people was in the little group that was there. And I told them that it was the will of the Lord for me to come, and they were going to vote on me. <laughs> and five of them abstained. <laughs> I got two votes. <laughs> I told them they had missed God is coming anyhow. <laughs> and the five that abstained left me in one month. <laughs> Amen. But uh, I pastored that little church. God give us a great church. In four years, it was 450 received the Holy Ghost in that, in that work. That city had frustrated our district time and time again. The doors had been closed on 15 occasions, and three or four of the pastors had backslidden uh, in trying to bring a work into, into Wheeling. But I remember, I remember Brother Sism was so, <laughs> was so hurt, so very hurt that I was there, and uh, he came. He was regional director for Asia at the time. And in those days, he didn't stay very many places more than one day. But he came and stayed wheeling two or three days, and his purpose was to persuade me that I had missed God. And uh, when you're doing home missionary work, you have to get down out of the ivory tower, roll up your sleeves, and, and go to work. Isn't that right? There's no other way to do it. And uh, I had to do the cleaning of that little hall, 18 feet wide and 50 feet long, something like that. And I didn't want Brother Sism to see me. And uh, But it's pretty hard to hide anything from him. And while I was running the sweeper over there, he came over and seen me. And he didn't mean to hurt me. He meant to persuade me. He looked at me and he said, Billy, once you preached to thousands, and now you're a janitor. And I staggered. I thought I would faint. I just staggered. But somehow I was able to keep standing. And when I got alone, I wept until the carpet was wet with my tears. And I went to the airport with him. And I watched his plane disappear in the sky. I stood there and stared into the sky without moving for 45 minutes. And finally, I audibly said, Harry, forgive me for calling him Harry. I've called him Harry for years. I said, Harry, I'd like to go with you, but I can't. God has put me on the potter's wheel, and I must not resist the hands of the potter. Praise the Lord. I want to do his will, don't you? Whatever that happens to be. Let's lift our hands and praise the Lord together again. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yesterday morning in this session, we talked about where the apostle said, I have kept nothing back that is profitable. And down in verse 26 and uh, 27, For I have, shun have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God, emphasizing the importance of being faithful to the Word. Our experiences and our thoughts are only important as long as they are in harmony with God's Word. I don't care what kind of an experience you I was on a panel one time, and a very, very gifted person, greatly used of God, was on the panel with me. 
and uh, no longer with us, of course, made the remark, we're not going to answer you today according to the Bible, but according to our experiences. And I thought within my heart, buddy, you may answer that way, but not me. Because <laughs> my experiences are absolutely of no value unless, unless the conclusion is in harmony with God's Word. That's, we lose this guideline, then we're just like a ship in the ocean without a rudder. Amen. We've got to hold true to the Word of God. And we've got to have a personal conviction in these things. I cannot pastor my church according to your conviction. I can't do it. I mean, if you're convicted, and uh, it's hard enough to hold the standards if you're convicted. Isn't that right? But... Uh, I cannot hold your convictions. I have got to have a conviction in my own heart, not just in my head, not just head knowledge, but it's got to be in my spirit because we transmit what we are and what we feel a whole lot more than what we say. My daddy used to like, like to say, you'll teach a little bit by what you say, but you'll teach a whole lot by what you are. Amen. And so we must have a personal conviction about these things. And we must not be intimidated by big tithe payers. <laughs> you know, there's getting some folk in our churches that are wealthy. And we must not let these people control the Word of God. We're going to be just like the denominations if we do. We must not mistreat them. We can't humiliate them and... Uh, and mistreat them, but uh, how much someone pays in tithes or gifts must not, must not determine what we preach and teach. Praise the Lord. And thirdly, in the way of review, let me just make mention of this, and we've got to hold fast when our kids become teenagers. That is a real test. And you fathers that have teenage children, if you think that's a test, wait until your grandkids are teenagers. My, you got quiet on me. <laughs> Maybe I should have spent a little time on that one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It may be difficult. Praise the Lord. It may be difficult. My, my grandchildren make me awful happy. The greatest joy I have is my children and my grandchildren uh, so totally sold out to the church. My oldest grandson, 15 years old, was called on to preach at the last camp. And eight got the Holy Ghost when he got through preaching. <laughs> Just throw me to death. Just praise the Lord. Don't you love the Lord today? Let's praise him again. I praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'd like to look at something different today. Uh, look at verse 22 and 23 of this farewell address. One of the most astounding things in his address very astounding. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit under Jerusalem. Notice it says, not knowing. Things happen to us. It's a surprise, confusing, and the devil will whip us to death because somehow or another in the Spirit we didn't know about it. Not knowing. The things that shall befall me there. Here, the great Apostle Paul, with all of his education, with all of his training, and with all of the tremendous anointing and power that God has given to him to minister to others, finds himself in a bewildering situation in his personal matters. I think we need to know this because the devil will, 
will absolutely torment us and harass us to death when things that are common to man happen to us and he will he will just badger us if you're truly apostolic if you're really full of the Holy Ghost and you really have the anointing that that somehow you thought you had and here this thing happens to you how do you explain all of that well these things happen to the Apostle Paul one of the very greatest apostles that ever lived so greatly anointed and he was subject to problems the obvious conclusion of an apostle is that he never has any problems and whatever may come along he'd just say in the name of Jesus and zap it'd be taken care of hey you're going to get a rude awakening it just doesn't happen that way it does not happen that way amen amen and uh, we have to go through these things uh, I uh, recently was called to Thailand uh, just before Christmas uh, brother Chayung Watanajan's wife just suddenly died obviously of a heart attack and within 15 minutes he had called me he was alone with his wife and uh, he was just absolutely devastated just devastated and he said to me Ajahn Kunwani Dai Pachasong Rap Paniyabai and I understood that perfectly he said God my wife has gone to be with the Lord and and I, I thought what does he mean what what is he saying and and I said what you say Chayu and he told me again and again I just couldn't receive it I, I, I understood that he meant she had died and uh, and uh, she hardly been sick a day in her life and uh, and then he shouted at me and said my wife has died and went to be with the Lord and then this tremendous wail and uh, she had just died 15 minutes when he called me and uh, and I just I just uh, couldn't believe it you know I, I was just overwhelmed amen and I made preparations to go and to be with him as, as quickly as I could and uh, I got there by Christmas Eve about midnight Christmas Eve about 11 p.m. and Chai Yung is a very apostolic man <laughs> he is apostolic from head to toe and very strong he's not a big man physically but he he is uh, he is in charge over there under the great anointing of the Lord but when I met him at the airport he was just like a little schoolboy and had just been embarrassed in front of his whole class he was just he was broken he was his head was down thank God he was able to respond to our presence and to the presence of God and to the to the Word of God and we buried her on Christmas Day and he became so strong that he gave a beautiful speech at her funeral greatly anointed of the Lord praise God and the thing that puzzled him so much he kept saying to me brother Cole he calls me ah John he said ah John uh, the thing that I can't understand is God always forewarns me when one of our preachers is going to go through some great suffering or if they if they're having some great personal problem God always forewarns me and that's the truth that's the truth if if some pastor no matter how remote he may be living in the jungle or wherever God reveals to brother Chai Yung about this before it happens <clears throat> and he said but this took me by total surprise the difference is it was his own family and we've all got to suffer this isn't that true and we need is if we understand that we can go through these problems better see the devil will tell you that God has forsaken you and that you're in a class all by yourself and no one else has ever went through this that's one of his tricks remembering that his tool is his voice and his eloquence that's the only tool he's got is his his voice 
talking to us. He don't have a sword. We don't need to be afraid of him, but he can talk to us. We can talk. He can talk to us. Amen. And so he was troubled, but thank God he was able to, to respond. Now the Lord revealed to Sister uh, Watana John that uh, she was going to die. We didn't know about it until after the funeral. One of the little college girls that was going to law school was there with her. He, Brother Chai Yung was out of town. And Brother Chai Yung's son, Chai, was at universities a couple hundred miles away. And he called his mother and said, Mother, I had a, a dream or a vision. In the Thai language, it's hard to tell which they had, uh, whether it was a dream or a vision. And he said, I had a vision of my father with both of his arms tore off of him. And he was walking around with blood on him. And his mother comforted him and said, your father will be all right. said, you pray. He is traveling among the churches, but he will be all right. And one of the greatest dangers in Thailand is accidents on the highway. And uh, when she hung up the phone, and little Jew was her name, little college girl didn't tell us <clears throat> until after the funeral she said when she hung up the phone she turned to her and said Jew I'm going to die I am Chai Yung's arms that's all she said and three days later she was dead with a heart attack God revealed it to her but he didn't reveal it to Chai Yung and there's going to be things happen to us there's going to be things happen to you that is so sudden, automobile wrecks or whatever. That doesn't mean that God has forsaken you. That means that you're a human being and that we've got to suffer these things. That doesn't mean that you're not apostolic. That doesn't mean that you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. These things happen to Paul. Here he was going to Jerusalem and he said, this great man that had all the insights uh, better than anyone else, says, I don't know what's going to happen to me. And he wouldn't have said that if he hadn't have known. There was people telling him what was going to happen, but he himself didn't know. Amen. Amen. And so it is. So many times when we minister to people in the area that you excel could very be well the area in which you are least and most, most vulnerable. How many times have you seen people that are greatly used of God to pray for the sick and for them to be miraculously healed and they themselves have a very fragile and frail sick body? It has happened so many times, so many times. I, some of the men that I know the best that are greatly used of God to pray for the sick, I have buried them when they were only 50 years old help bury them in funerals. That's right. Jesus himself gives great joy. But the Bible says that he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. It's a constant pouring out. The ministry is a constant pouring out. We just constantly pour out of ourselves until sometimes when we go home, and we reach into the well for a little bit of something for ourselves and the bucket just clanks on the bottom and hits the rocks and there's nothing there for us. That's the importance of these meetings that we can be refreshed and restored. Can you say amen? Let's just praise the Lord together again. We love you, Lord Jesus. And I praise you, almighty God. Hallelujah. 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 Many times, many times for the sake of the saints, we dance. Don't tell me every time you preachers dance it's because you feel so much joy. It's because you know those saints need it. That's what the Lord said was the, was the hour, and we're not our own. We don't get in the pulpit and speak about our own feelings. There's times when I sit in my office, 10 minutes before church, I'm crying. I am distressed. 
I am miserable. I wish I could pull my hair and run. But when I walk out there to that pulpit, it's something else. I stand up straight, get the redness out of my face. Praise the Lord, saints of God. So wonderful to be here with you tonight. That's not lying. That's not hypocrisy. That's being disciplined and doing what God wants. And we're constantly pouring ourselves out. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 10 through 12. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifested in our mortal flesh. Look at verse 12. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Life in your saints, death in you. Amen. That ex should explain a lot of your feelings. And when you have those feelings, you can count on the devil whispering to you and telling you you're backslid. You don't feel no joy. You're backslid. When you go to carrying around what we carry around, it's hard to jump very high with tons of burden upon your shoulders. Isn't that right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't let the devil lie to you. God bless your hearts. We sing that old song, and I love it, and I, I appreciate the beautiful meaning that is paramount in the song about the one lost sheep being me, that the Lord saved me. But it begins, safe in the fold were the ninety and nine. Well, that's beautiful, but that's not true. That is not true. The Scripture doesn't say safe in the fold. The Scripture says he left the ninety and nine in the wilderness. Look at it. Luke chapter 15 and verse 4. <laughs> what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? Brethren, we're in a wilderness. And you can get hurt out here. don't mean to frighten you. I'm just trying to help you to understand some of the feelings that you, that you have. Jesus said, I'm going to send you forth as sheep among wolves. And you can get hurt. You can become diseased. You can become wounded. You can become spiritually wounded. All these things we have to cope with. There is only one answer, and that is to save yourself from this untoward generation. We've got to save ourselves, we've got to save our wife, and we've got to save our children, and we've got to save our grandchildren. Whatever the devil may attack you with, he'll attack your wife or your husband, or he'll attack your children. When, uh, whenever you may be in a position that you're so strong that the devil can't get to you, he's going to attack your family. He really will. They won't escape. But God is able to help you and minister to your family and save your family. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are these things important to you? Praise God. The great Apostle Paul. Great Apostle Paul. So greatly used of the Lord to bring in new works and, and the ministry of healing and miracles and uh, one time he was preaching, and a guy went to sleep, broke his neck. Paul just went down there and laid hands on him, and he was okay the next day. He was fine. Praise the Lord. That's great. But he himself had to suffer. Just, just a few chapters later, we find the apostle Paul handcuffed to a, a centurion, to a captain of the Roman army or wherever, and... Uh, He's on his way, and God reveals to him that there's going to be a terrible storm. And he says, let's don't sail. 
But the captain that he was handcuffed to listened to the owner of the ship and said, we're going to sail. Everything's fine. And the scripture says that when the soft breezes blew, everything was calm. And calm. <laughs> and uh, things were not commodious there in that harbor. The things were not convenient. And they said, we're going to, to sail. We're going to go. Go on. And uh, they, they would not be persuaded. Now, Paul had no choice. He was handcuffed to that guy. Amen. And if that captain went, he had to go. And it wasn't long until a terrible, tempestuous sea came. A horrible storm. A storm that was so bad, the scripture says, that they couldn't see the sun or the stars for many days. And that ship was being torn to pieces. And they began throwing stuff off of the ship. And the scripture says that the sailors, 276 people on that ship, and they were so terrified that they had no hope of salvation whatsoever. They had no hope of surviving at all. No hope. They, they, they went on a fast. They wouldn't even eat. They thought, what is the use? We're all going to die. Now, whenever sailors, now, it's nothing for me, you know, to get in a storm and on a ship and, and think we're all going to die. But it's something else for sailors to think they're going to die. Those that are experienced, they wouldn't have been running that ship if they hadn't have been experienced. I remember the first time I was ever on a ship, and I hope it's the last time. So when I went to went to Thailand, and the first time we, we went out of San Francisco, and the first day we was out, we got in this horrible storm, and I don't know how high the waves were. I know one thing. I was on top of the ship, an old freighter, and our room was right in the highest point of the ship, and we had these round portholes, you know, for, for windows, and those waves were smashing against those portholes at the top of that ship. <laughs> and my wife and baby were so sick. Oh, they were sick. <laughs> I was all right as long as I was laying down, but when I got up to minister to them, my, that ship took a dip, and I run up the wall and fell on the floor on my back. It was... <laughs> God, God bless all you sailors. You can have them all. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's right. That ship would go up like that, and then it would come down. And when it come down, it'd go clear under the water. And when it would come up, the water would run off the deck like Niagara Falls. Oh. <laughs> my, my, my. Oh, oh, my. The missionary board don't make you go by ship anymore, thank God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But here was experienced sailors that were so, I don't know what kind of a storm it was. It, it must have been furious. Maybe a tornado or something like that. It was, it was so terrible that they spared for their lives. They did not believe that they were going to survive. And the Apostle Paul was right in the middle of it. He was just as much apostolic as he ever was. He had just as much of the Holy Ghost as he ever did. He may have had a little more, but this time. <laughs> Praise God. But he was into it. And for 14 days, they couldn't even see the sun. And finally, an angel of the Lord appeared unto, unto Paul and said that they were all going to be saved. But they got in the water before they were saved. They were floating on logs and, and splinters of that ship before they were saved. That ship broke half in two. And they got to the island the best way they could. And it wasn't over then. Snake bit him when he's gathering up a little uh, a fire. God bless your hearts. Can you imagine how the devil would try to talk to you in a situation like that? Tell you that God has forsaken. Look at you. You've given your life to God. And you've preached the gospel and folks have been saved and healed and, and, and their homes have been mended. And look at you. Look at you. Look at you. The mess you're in. Where, where is your God now? 
I don't care if you are the greatest preacher, the greatest pastor, the most anointed speaker that ever lived. You will go through problems. We've heard of something of Brother Rex Johnson's severe trials in this, in this camp meeting. And what a preacher he is. God bless your heart. We will go through these things. But the wonderful thing is that God was with him and brought him out of that. Not only that, he brought out those that was with him. If Paul had not have been in that ship, they'd all died. Every last one of them would have died. But because Paul was with them, they were all saved. And sometimes we're going to go through storms that we had absolutely nothing to do with. But we are attached to people. If you think you're not handcuffed, you are. You're handcuffed to that woman you live with. <laughs> or that man you live with. Those children that you have. Those grandkids. They're going to get themselves into storms. That you're going to have to go through the storms with them. But God will save them if you'll just not lose your faith. You may get wet before it's over with. You may be riding a log out in the middle of the ocean somewhere before it's over with, but God will save you and them. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I recently went to visit a local church, very good church, one of our best churches, one of our finest pastors, very excellent. I love him. And so many times that I have went to the church there and felt led of God to go, we had a good time at the church, but about every time I go, it's not for his church, but for him. And I don't go that often. But uh, again, this happened. And we had a wonderful service, good service. And then we were traveling the next day to visit a pastor that was sick and in the hospital. And uh, then, then I realized what I was feeling about him. He turned to me and said, Brother Cole... I need to confide in you. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me that you would have the answer. And whatever God told you to tell me to do, I'm going to do. But I'm in trouble up to my ears. And he began to tell me what had happened. That there was a young woman in his church, 22 years old, had seduced his teenage boy. And she was pregnant. And the church didn't know about it yet. And uh, it's already three months had passed and they were running out of time because uh, the whole church had known about it a little while. He said, I have decided to resign and leave this good church and my heart is broken. And uh, I was able to give him counsel as to what to do. He called me the other day. But he told me that day, he said, I am absolutely devastated. I am devastated. He said, I have been a preacher of joy. And, and he said, I have no joy. My joy is gone. He said, I'm miserable every day. And he said, I had so many hopes for that boy he, and uh, so forth. And, uh, and she wants to marry him. And uh, she's, and he, his problem was big. But the Lord gave me an answer for him. And the other day he called me and was going on a little vacation. He said, Brother Cole, I did exactly what you told me to do. And said, the church rushed to me and embraced me and held me up. <laughs> Praise God. He said, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Sometimes we'll find ourselves in terrific storms. My counsel to him was, you need to get to this boy. He needs to understand that he has sinned. But you've got to love that boy. That's your boy, and he is a boy. These teenage kids, we can't just discipline like them like we would an elder sitting on our platform. There's a lot of difference between a teenager and an elder sitting on your platform. Can you say amen? And we have to love these kids and, and help them to get it worked out. I advised him, this is off the subject, 
But you all want me to tell you what I told him. <laughs> I'm reading it loud. Clear. I said, you're dealing with a woman here. You must minister to her. That child must be taken care of. That child must not be brought up in reproach. Child's going to have to be supported. But I would not marry any two that didn't love each other. I would not marry them if they didn't love each other. If they didn't both love each other, I would not marry them. But I'd take care of that child. And you must forgive that boy. He is a boy. You must forgive him. He must understand that it is wrong, that he has sinned. But he must be forgiven and ministered to. I tell you, when sometimes, you know, we have a tendency of going two directions. We have a tendency of being totally liberal towards our children, or we, we go to the other side. We're extremely harsh and just make an absolute spectacle of our, our family. I think both things is wrong. We've got to treat our children the same way we would uh, the other children. Praise God. I told him that on a midweek service that when everything was... Uh, uh, good and the spirit was right just to call the saints to the altar and tell them what has happened don't use the woman's name don't use her name don't use her name everybody will know who she is but say your son has ha has sinned and this problem has arised and uh, we're troubled about it and that's what he did and the church just rushed to him and ministered to them and they had already set themselves down the boy and the young woman had already taken themselves out of the choir and out of the music and so forth. So let them sit down a while. And before that baby is born, reinstate her to full fellowship so that there'll be no reproach on that child. That I may have spoiled my whole day telling you what I did. <laughs> Amen, because you may be thinking I've done it wrong. But uh, that's beside the point. The point is he was in trouble. That's the point I want to make. He was in trouble, and it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. He was handcuffed to that boy. Can you say amen? Praise the Lord. And we will have things like, and, 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 and you can lay down on the floor behind your pulpit and squall and carry on if you want to and talk to the church like the end of the world has come. But you know what's going to happen? You're going to bury that kid. That kid will commit suicide. Well, had to do over again. I wouldn't tell you what I told. <laughs> we have to go on there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we have to save these cats. We don't compromise with them. There's, we've got to get this thing of compromise and love straightened out. There's a difference between compromise and love. We must never stop loving. I don't believe we ought to stop loving preachers that fall. We can't compromise with them, but we need to embrace them every time we see them and tell them we love them. We're praying for them, encourage them, and strengthen them. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless your heart. And, and, and Paul, it wasn't Paul's fault. Now, there are occasions where you can just buy your own ticket straight into the storm, you know, through rebellion. Just through rebellion, you can just shove yourself and, and refusing to do the will of God. We've got to stay in the will of God. We must stay in the will of the Lord. The Lord called Jonah to go down and preach to Nineveh. And he said, I'm not going. And the Lord said, yes, you are going, because I'm going to kill them. They're a bunch of sinners, and uh, I, I don't want to kill them until they've been warned, and I want you to go down there and warn them. I'm going to kill them. And Jonah said, good, I hate them too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'll be glad to tell them. But you won't do it. They'll repent, and then you won't kill them. <laughs> that's the way it was, isn't it? I know I've been doing a lot of paraphrasing, but uh, that's just about the way it happened. 
Hallelujah. And he ended up in a storm, but it was his own making because he refused to do the will of God. Amen. But there are other storms, and you've preached it. You've preached it, but we have a tendency of forgetting what we preach when the problem comes to us. So let me remind you. One little thing I did for this brother that I was telling you about, I found a tape, four-year-old tape, where he had preached a camp meeting, and uh, he preached about just such a situation and, and how God was going to help you. <laughs> I took the label off of it and sent it to him. I told him, I said, the voice is a little raspy, and, and, but I think you'll recognize to each other. I've already talked about that, but let me just read one verse of Scripture in it. Addition, verse 25. Please like, comment, and subscribe.